All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're uh, welcome. Uh, it's uh, uh, an, an early morning, depending on where you come from in the in the world uh, or in the country. And um, I want to thank everybody for coming to our kickoff session for the communications and EPO track uh, here at the uh, uh, here at the workshop. So this morning, we're going to start off with uh, discussions on communications and EPO. And we have both uh, Corey Bassett, who is the Creative Services Branch Chief from the Office of Legislative and Public Affairs at NSF. And then we also have Lars Lindbergh, who is the Head of Communications at NSF's NOIR Labs. And I will go ahead and shut up at this point, uh, just as a, but as a quick reminder, uh, if you have your cell phones, you just might want to check them and make sure that they are on silent uh, before we go ahead and get started. But I will turn this over to Corey, so thank you. Corey. <laughs> All right, so as he mentioned, I'm Corey Bassett. I am right now the branch chief for creative services. I'm also actually the acting branch chief for media and public affairs. Uh, we had one of our branch chiefs leave, so I'm three quarters of our OPA office. But I hope that everyone had a chance to come see the booth, uh, take a selfie either last night or during the week and pick up the flash drive that included a lot of really good branding resources. Uh, for those of you that are virtual, uh, those resources will also be available on nsf.gov. So with that, let's get started. Okay, so we are with, as I mentioned, Office of Legislative and Public Affairs. We support NSF and its mission. And part of what we do here is, in particular, support the director. So we do a lot, all the presentations that the, the NSF director does externally, we're involved in sort of developing those designs. Uh, we have four different branches within OPA, and essentially we handle the brand management uh, and outreach both for media and congressional relations. Our business operations branch handles, as you might imagine, our administration. Uh, Creative Services is our uh, brand management, our social media and web presence, as well as our radio spot and podcast discovery files. Government Affairs handles our congressional outreach. And Public and Media Affairs handles media inquiries as well as uh, event uh, outreach. So I want to talk a little bit about why branding is important for NSF, but I want to first sort of start about what exactly is branding. So branding is more than the visual identity. It's how we talk about ourselves and how we show up in the world. The visual identity is really only scratches the surface in terms of what, what branding looks like. Uh, strong branding will help your audiences be more receptive to your messaging. It helps audiences remember and identify and distinguish you from other agencies. Uh, if you see the NASA logo, you're pretty sure you know what NASA does. And so it's a very distinctive logo and they do have a very strong uh, brand management program. It also helps increase uh, attention to NSF funded programs and, and opportunities and facilities. And so the idea here is that by having a more robust and comprehensive uh, branding sort of raises all boats. When NSF visibility is raised up, it also raises the visibility of all the things that we support. So we have embarked on a branding initiative. And that's what I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about today. Uh, it's a multi-step initiative that essentially we're looking to help increase the clarity of guidance in terms of how people are using logos, what they need, and really understand where some of the challenges and gaps are in, um, in this. And so we started out by, by doing research. Uh, we looked at other like agencies and just look at how they handled their brand management, their, their branding guidelines, where they found gaps in knowledge and where they felt like um, you know, they needed more assistance or places that worked really well. We also looked at the private sector and the public sector, uh, in particular other foundations to see more for inspiration and understand some of the challenges that they had and to look at how we can best look at setting up processes to ensure that the brand management is easy to use, but also includes all the people that need to look at things. Uh, next, we reviewed, we took a look at all of the ways that we NSF brand our own thing. So we looked internally first. Um, we talked with directorates. We, over the course of the last year and a half, we worked with directorates on a number of design projects. And so we got a sense of the things where they were struggling. We got a lot of really good use cases in terms of trying to understand 
where the logo made sense, where it didn't, how to place things, all those kinds of things. Um, and we really looked at what were some of the barriers to implementation. And I'll talk a little bit later about the results of the external branding survey that we did. It was very helpful in helping us understand where we need to go in terms of being more helpful and supportive uh, for those of you using the branding. So engage. Uh, as I mentioned, we did an external survey that uh, I think many of you participated in, and I thank you for those of you who participated. We also did an internal branding survey to NSF staff with some of the sim some same questions. And so it was interesting to see uh, some of the similarities between the external results we got and the internal results. And I'll, I'll talk about those in a little bit. Uh, expand. So at, as we were looking to um, develop a NSF brand, an official NSF branding policy. In the meantime, one of the things we did was expand the current logo guidelines. Uh, and so maybe you may be familiar with that. It's on NSF Gov. It really sort of explains how and where you use the logo. So a couple of things that we did, we expanded the color palette. Uh, before there were only a couple colors that we were really using within the NSF branding. What we realized is that that's very inflexible. It makes it very difficult for people to take um, take that and then make their own um, their own visuals with that. And so we added a secondary color palette. So it makes it much easier. There's much more flexibility in being able to use all of those colors uh, to be able to design various things that, that help sort of tell, tell the story. We also looked at the fonts. There was a font that we had in the uh, visual guidelines that was no longer accessible. And so we switched out one of those fonts to make it much easier for people to be able to use and ensure that it was uh, yeah, five-way compliance. Um, we had did a lot of meetings with um, the directorates, the sort of listing sessions to understand what are some of the challenges they have when they're talking to grantees and trying to give them um, advice or advise them on situations that come up. You know, some of the use cases that came up were things like naming, whether it was a new center or a new fellowship or, or whatever. Um, in some cases, it was a, a facility being built or whatever the case was. We, we were able to get a lot of information in terms of where are some of the things that really uh, need some more help. And then our last piece, um, we actually provided uh, more sort of how-to guides. And one of the big things that we did is we launched a NSF branding portal. So in the branding portal, we have uh, templates for PowerPoints, we have templates for fact sheets. And one of the big things we did was we added a, an icon library. And you'll see some of the icons uh, up here that I will show you some of those probably designed for this uh, presentation. So we started out with a handful of icons that were appropriately um, branded with the right colors that people could use interchangeably, meaning one icon doesn't necessarily mean one thing. So the icons you see here in my presentation could be used for multiple different ways. So we started out with, I don't know, I think maybe a dozen icons and we're now to now probably a couple hundred. Um, and so when a director would go into the branding portal and say, you know, I need, a, I need an icon for this, I don't see it, can you build us one? And so that's, that's how we've sort of done it. So for example, our off the polar programs was looking for an icon that looked more like an icebreaker ship. So we had a boat. It wasn't really looking like an icebreaker. So we just designed an icon that looked more like an icebreaker. And so it's been really successful. And what's interesting is you've seen um, in the presentations and in a lot of the uh, products, more and more use of the icons, which means people are, are getting more on board with the branding. It's been actually very, very successful. So the one thing I would say that I want you to take away from today is that um, when it comes to branding and guidance, I realize that sometimes it is not top of mind um, when you're trying to roll out an announcement or open up a facility. Uh, there's a lot of things that go into that. And sometimes branding is not always something that people are thinking about. But I want you to know that we are definitely here to be supportive and helpful. Um, I know that initially, um, I would heard the story of how the, the branding initiative first started. Uh, and so we're trying to, have a different approach. Um, we're trying to really look at how can we best understand where the gaps in knowledge are and be able to support and offer resources um, that will really help help people make it easy, right? We're trying to lower those barriers to entry. So it's not like having to look through a 50 page document to figure out where is this logo supposed to go? How am I supposed to comply with, with this? One thing I'll say is on the flash drives, um, additional thing is that we have um, 
the the big uh, infrastructure map. I think you may have saw it outside. So that is on that flash drive. So we have that file that you can use. So our external survey. So we saw a survey earlier this year to accomplish a few things. We wanted to understand some of the challenges and opportunities that people had in the field uh, as they were using the branding. We wanted to understand the types uh, of support and resources that would be most helpful in being able to easily use the branding. And we also wanted to start a conversation and be able to build that rapport with our stakeholders to better understand uh, how we can work together and be able to ensure that the, the branding is something that is easy to use and not, not a barrier. So we surveyed PIs, uh, public information officers, uh, and institutions, communicators, and many of you here at the facilities communicators. Um, we sent out about 8,000 um, surveys. We got 1,080 responses. And one thing that's interesting is that of those different groups, um, the PI group was the one that we heard from the most. That was the bit largest response group. Um, so of that 147 were from facilities. And interestingly, uh, nearly 60% had little or no familiarity with the NSF uh, logo guide. And I think partly that's reflected in the fact that our largest uh, response rate was from PIs. Uh, it also tells us that we need to do a better job of getting those resources out to the people who are, who are, who are looking for them. Uh, some of the top obstacles um, for people who were trying to incorporate NSF branding uh, included being unsure if it was appropriate. Do I put this here? I'm not really sure. I don't know. Or if it was allowed. And I'll talk a little bit more about some of the, in the next slide, some of the comments that we got in terms of what, what that really looks like. Um, we asked about where do they use the logo most often. Here's a list of some of the ways that they use the logo. And then we also asked, what would be the most helpful resource for you in terms of being able to make brand, having branding much, be much more easy? Um, templates, targeted fact sheets, mockups and blueprints. And so what that tells us is that people need to see what it looks like. It's not enough to have a document that you read through to say, here's what you have to do. You really have to be able to see what it looks like to make it as easy as possible. Okay. So some of the feedback that we got was that is very helpful. And I will say that it sort of ranged from concern to helpful to, I'm not sure I understand this. So we ended up grouping the comments into four kind of major sort of buckets, identity, representation, design and logistics, and directions and guidance. So I'll, I'll give you some examples of some of the things that we heard in each of those sort of buckets. So for identity, uh, we heard that people were concerned um, that including the NSF name or logo could imply some sort of endorsement. Uh, there was concern about, or there was something raised about, you know, the work is, while the work is being supported by NSF, it's not really NSF, NSF isn't responsible for the conclusions. Um, there was worry about confusion on websites where an NSF logo was present. Would people be confused that it was actually going to be an NSF website? Um, clarifying that while a grantee has NSF funding, it doesn't actually mean we're NSF. Like when you put that logo on there, do people then have that impression? Um, and the other, the other one with an identity was sort of the idea that branding is a bit culturally and socially controversial in the community with the idea that it's a very collaborative, oops, sorry, collaborative nature uh, within the scientific community and having one, uh, one branding, one look, the idea of that seemed very constrictive. Uh, representation. So this really speaks to the concern about having uh, the collaborative nature of scientific inquiry and the idea that if we have both domestic and international partners, how do we balance talking about that? How do we balance that brand and who we say is responsible? Or how do we do that in a way that is that doesn't alienate people, but still allows for the greater sort of audience, the greater public to understand who's doing this and why and how? Uh, the next thing was sort of design logistics. So some of the challenges we heard, there were challenges making stickers that stay attached uh, to the NSF funded equipment that was being deployed. Um, again, balancing uh, the needs of all the partners. You know, you have 12 partners in there. How do you put 12 logos on a document? That's kind of difficult. You know, and how do you make sure that you have a clean and easy to understand design when you do have a lot of sort of partners in the mix? And the last thing was sort of guidance. Um, 
what we heard was on the print products, people seemed fairly clear on where things go. It tended to be more when you got into the digital products, websites and other things, it was a little more unclear. And, and the other piece was being more, having more clarity on the guidelines themselves. Um, you know, people were trying to read through things and then trying to interpret, uh, you know, on their own, like, what does this actually mean when they say, put this to the left of this or to the right of that? So as I mentioned, we're in the process of developing an official NSF policy. Um, we began working on it um, dra in drafts probably, I don't know, six or seven months ago. And it's, it's largely based on um, the current logo guidelines, but we're trying to distinguish between what is a policy and what is actually implementation. Um, so one of the goals we have is really to clarify the branding guidelines. We want to make it as easy as possible uh, for you to be able to uh, incorporate NSF branding. Um, we want to be able to create an official policy with very high level guidance that we can point back to and then have a document that really is more about the implementation of that policy versus having sort of one document all kind of mushed together. Um, we also want to expand on current practices, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, a little later. Um, and be able to incorporate some official processes. And part of that is bringing in some of our other partners within NSF, in particular, working with the Office of General Counsel, working with our Office of Contracts in terms of looking at um, the solicitations, in terms of terms and conditions, the PAPG, all of those things to make sure that we're consistent in how we're asking grantees to apply the NSF branding. And as I mentioned, having a more implementation focused document uh, in addition to the policy to make it much more easy, much easier to be able to implement that. So we'll do a quick review of uh, NSF visual identity. I think many of you are familiar with this, but I will just uh, touch on a few different things. Um, logos, are you using the right logo? Uh, we recently updated our logo file. Uh, if you were to look at it real quickly, it looks exactly the same. Uh, the file format is different. It's a much more scalable um, uh, version. So you'll be it's much easier to use. And we've uh, heightened the color a little bit. So please make sure that you go to NSFGov or uh, grab a flash drive on your way out um, for the revamped uh, logo. We also did a revamp of the identity guidelines, much easier to use, better organized. You'll see that on the flash drive as well as um, on the uh, on NSF.gov. So consistency. Uh, one of the keys to strengthening communication and branding is consistency. And honestly, the very unglamorous truth is that consistent, consistent use of your visual identity and the way you talk about yourself will make the biggest difference in the long run in terms of raising your visibility. I think people tend to really focus on the big ticket events as the way that your visibility is going to rise up. What you get is a, is a, is a nice spike right at that time, but it's not a lasting spike. If you really want to sort of raise your baseline of visibility, consistency is, is always the way to go. Because what, what happens is you want someone, when they look at your visual identity, they're hearing you talking about yourself or your agency, you want them to think about a certain thing. And so being consistent in how you talk about it will help them help get that sort of ingrained in their brain in terms of what is NSF, what do we do, how does this facility work? And then appropriate use. And that's really about where who can use the NSF logo, where can you use it, um, which things should be branded. Um, so I think, as you know, the NSF logo can be used by anybody who has uh, NSF support for acknowledging uh, our support, and that's sort of written out in the PAPG. Um, the NSF logo can be used uh, to link to another website, acknowledge NSF affiliation. Uh, can, it can be used, so ways it cannot be used. It cannot be used in a manner that falsely implies employment or a connection or affiliation. It cannot be used for endorsement of a product or service. And that one sometimes can be a little bit tricky and we always bring in our Office of General Counsel to take a look at something if we're unsure if it's gonna imply uh, endorsement. Uh, in terms of things that should be on, the logo should be on pretty much all the things. Um, that you can think of presentations, videos, backgrounds, et cetera. So I'm gonna give you a few um, good branding examples here and one funny, not good one. Um, so this is some examples of places where we had really good branding and it's, it's a nice mix of things that sort of shows places where, you know, there were multiple, um, multiple uh, logos being used um, in different areas on a car, uh, on some of the, the video at the bottom, the interview, the map. Um, and one of the things actually, so when we were at the um, RAF yesterday, 
So that was one of the first projects um, since I've been on that we were able to work directly with them while they were building it. Uh, we worked with their uh, designers and architects to make sure that the NSF branding on the building, in the building, around the building was all sort of aligned with NSF branding. So it was really exciting. So I'd seen the, um, the designs and the mock-ups uh, like a year ago. And so it was really exciting to actually get to walk the halls, you know, yesterday and see all the stuff that we had sort of talked about. And it was very cool. Um, so I'm going to show you now one example of not so good branding, which is kind of hilarious, actually. Uh, so please don't do this. I'm sure none of you have ever considered doing something like this, but I will just to point out, this is definitely not something we would do. And so the, the example here is we've seen people pull apart the logo and do different things with it. Um, the one thing I do, I wanted to add is that I think some of you probably, um, have a, a white version of the NSF logo that's like the spoke with the NSF in the middle. So we've retired that logo. We do have a, a, a alternative white logo if you need one. So definitely you know, get a hold of us if you do. But that one we're trying to sort of phase out of uh, phase out of our our use. And I think with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lars, and he's going to talk more about how NSF's Noir Lab handles branding. Thanks, Corey. Uh, <clears throat> so um, thanks for um, allowing me to speak. I am quite honored. So we were picked uh, not necessarily as a poster child, if uh, you will, but more as a real world example of how we work hand in hand with uh, the NSF branding guidelines and also some of our real uh, world uh, challenges. I have to say that NSF has come very far. Uh, I've observed the branding from the outside since the early 2000s, and I think NSF is now pretty front and center. So I'm not sure a lot more can be done, but of course we all have to make sure we adhere to those guidelines and do the very best. And um, I'll mention a little bit why. So Noalab is a um, astronomy organization for the first time all the ground-based optical observatories have been unified um, in one single organization. And our infrastructures, we call them programs, we, they consist of um, big telescopes on four mountaintops and then one data center. So five big infrastructures in the programs. And they're located in Arizona, in Hawaii, and down in Chile in the south. So the name of our organization is more important than one should think. Um, this has been the subject of discussion up through, I think, 2015, 16, 17, and ended with a decision. And we are called the National Optical Infrared Research Astronomy Research Laboratory. It just rolls off the tongue, right? Astronomers can be so wonderfully inventive with uh, these kinds of names. So obviously that's really a non-starter in terms of branding. We can't go out there with that as our main brand. Um, other examples, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Okay, you might know that one, but do you know the Conseil Européen pour la Recherche Nucléaire? No, but you know CERN. So that's kind of the, the deal. So we talked then with NSF and our um, sort of leadership over the next months um, from 2019 and landed on this NSF's Noir Lab as the name. Uh, and we could then finally start our website because we needed that short name in order to reserve the domain, et cetera, et cetera. So this became, if you will, our potential ticket to fame and name recognition, which is so important. So why do we brand? Well, first and foremost, to support NSF. I cannot overstate the importance of informing the taxpayers about the work that we all do out in the field, doing marvelous things in research. This is so important because eventually they are the ones paying the bill and enabling us to do this amazing, insightful research. Next layer down, obviously, from NSF, we need to build a recognizable organization. We need to attract high capacity staff. Uh, we need to attract exciting uh, projects, funding opportunities, et cetera. Next level down is that we have this organization consisting of these wonderful infrastructures. And why do we want to consolidate those? We need to because science has moved into becoming even more big science than ever before. And that's a continuous development. Science infrastructures are getting bigger. We need to 
band together and work together and avoid that fragmentation. Eventually, all of this is competing with all the other amazing opportunities that youngsters and everyone else have in society today. Entertainment industry, et cetera, is really very, very attractive, social media, and we need to be there front and center for people to offer our uh, information uh, to them. A couple of words about branding philosophy. So we looked at this when we started the organization and looked at other examples out in the world. And um, what do we do with this, Noala? We can either become a branded house, which is effectively a bit like Virgin and Amazon are doing their branding, not to necessarily compare the sizes. We are minuscule in, in comparison. But there is then one master brand or a mother brand or umbrella brand that um, sort of overarches and shows the strength of the organization. The opposite uh, way of branding is a house of brands. You see that with Procter & Gamble, which is not very well known, but you, you know the brands, the Ariel or Fairy or Old Spice, which is what they go out and they really promote heavily. They each have their own visual identity uh, manuals for those uh, products. And we landed on this branded house as our uh, philosophy uh, in order to stand up against the competition around us. Um, Corey asked me to, to list some tips and tricks and, you know, I, I couldn't really come up with much other than really having good organizational processes and, and workflows. So we set up a logo archive very early on thinking we'll put our 10 logos in there and, you know, make sure everyone has access. And I think last count, we are now at 170 logos. So I'm very glad we did that because um, as things turned out, it was a lot more complicated than any of us thought. So also having good processes when we develop things like written communication, press releases, making sure that we are on the same pages, both internally and externally with our reviews, asking our program officers at NSF for quotes, tying things together, making sure that we get the right people out there and being visible, both on the funding side as well as on the research side. And then the importance of a visual identity should also not be understated. It is really a powerful tool. And one little kind of quirk to that is we started a visual identity, of course, very early on. We started a collaborative document and all sort of the creative folks and, and I and others put in ideas and we then kept on working. And we're now on version 1.2.1 and we keep having sort of interesting interesting use cases appear in our wonderfully complex organization and keep updating and making sort of little tweaks. So that's, a, a, I'd say, a dynamic process which uh, cements and documents the decisions that are then uh, taken along the way. And the importance of vector logos, as Corey also just mentioned, we got the NSF vector logo um, when it was released, and that was a great help because we could then make these scalable graphics, which are so useful um, in reality. Many of you know about visual identity, so I don't need to uh, dwell too much on that, but it is really the official manual that sets out the uh, visual aspects of branding. It needs to be flexible, comprehensive, intuitive, accurate, and practical. It's something that is useful and something that we all need to know and that documents um, how we go about with our brand and with the connection with uh, NSF. It has, for instance, uh, information about this, which is about our particular logo, why is it what it is, why are the colors, what they are, how do they signify our infrastructures and things of that sort. And here are some examples of how that uh, visual identity is used. Uh, these are print products. You see at the left, some internal documents, if you will, the visual identity or some internal style guide for uh, English products. But then you see some more um, program oriented products. Uh, you see, for instance, a brochure called the Gemini Capabilities, which is going deep into one of our infrastructures and offers to the users of the infrastructures information about how to use all the instruments on that telescope. And you will see that there's a, a ton of logos on that brochure. So we're slowly kind of coming to the point where it gets really interesting in our case. Um, we have the NSF logo together with the Noalab logo pretty much in all products except where it's physically not possible to put in or if it's internal or if it is a business card, for instance, because as Corey said, we're not 
actually NSF staff. We don't want to impersonate NSF. And that's kind of the guideline we, we take with us and try to show NSF, but also stay on the right side of that particular uh, dilemma. On the right side, you see our programs, and they also have logos as they are a very strong brand each individually. You see also the little quirk with the Gemini logo. So we actually developed a Gemini logo that is in line with the rest of the logos, but we haven't been able to get the final sign off from the Gemini board. And that may take a while or may never happen. So that also is an example of where we have, of course, different partners. NSF is a majority partner in Gemini is around two thirds but we have other very important partners and we have to respect, of course, their needs and, um, and work with them. A couple of examples of our website, our uh, collateral, our car branding, our uh, building branding. You see here the actual building logos and function in the um, NSF manual, you will see examples from ships and planes, which is always funny for the scientists to see. We don't have ships or planes, but we do have buildings. So, And, uh, and of course, also telescopes. And we try to show the program, the infrastructure uh, names and logos as much as we possibly can. So how do we make a new big science organization known without having to resort to all kinds of um, footnotes and asterisks, which really doesn't work. You get one shot, you get one message out there. So um, U.S. funding in general in science is, is really a wonderful patchwork. In our case, we have 150 smaller or bigger partners, and many of those are fundamental to our existence. We, for instance, work very heavily with the Department of Energy. And also there is this dilemma with the programs, um, with their own culture, and understandably a very strong uh, wish and need to also remain visible brands. I'm just going to flash these maps of our U.S. partners first. They're color-coded depending on which infrastructure that um, work with the different universities around the country, but a fantastic patchwork of how deep an organization really go out in the country. And it gets even more colorful if you look at a world map, because many of our infrastructures, especially the Rubin Observatory, really work with people around the globe, as science should and is doing. This is how it is, and it's wonderful. But of course, we also get a patchwork of branding and logos, and we have to navigate that, show the right things at the right time without pushing brands down. And, um, and that is kind of uh, one of the more interesting challenges on, on my desk in my daily um, life. So as Corey alluded to, branding can often be snickered at by the scientists. It is a sort of anti, anti antithesis of, of science. It is not really what we do. We don't brand, but it is what we do. And it is what we have to do in order to stand up and be visible. It's often a little bit hard to have the authority in my position to make the necessary decisions. They go very deep into the society and the environment of the scientists and the funding partners around uh, the, the globe. And then a little um, cheeky one at the end, having this NSF's Noir Lab as our official name makes for some very funny sentences sometimes. So you have to be <laughs> quite <laughs> inventive when we do our writing. So I think that was it from my side. Thanks. I know you thought you got rid of me and it was all done, but there is more. Okay, so talk a little bit about acknowledging NSF. So within the terms and conditions in the PAPG, there's a couple lines, it's, I think actually only one line, uh, that talks about how to use uh, NSF branding. Um, what we hope is that the grantees are using the NSF full color logo um, and, and making sure that that's included in any digital print products. Um, if NSF is the primary funder, that logo should be given prominence in size and in position among other partners. Um, if possible, the logo should be accompanied by a uh, text that includes the relationship to NSF funded by partner, grantee, fellow, et cetera. Um, if NSF is predominantly, and we're right now sort of saying that's more than 50% predominantly funded facility, center, uh, external program, et cetera, um, the idea would be much like uh, NSF's Noir Lab is to pair that NSF logo with whatever logo currently exists and then adding NSF or NSFs into the, the text reference. Um, 
So as part of the new policy, um, there may be some program solicitations or and or cooperative agreements that may need some more specific language on branding. And we're working very closely with our Office of Contracts policy and our Office of General Counsel to figure out what does that look like to make sure that it's easy to understand aligns with sort of NSF philosophy, as well as make sure that it doesn't create any undue burdens on, on anybody. Um, the other thing I would say is that we're really hoping to enlist the program officers in helping uh, us ensure that the NSF brand is being appropriately used. And interestingly, you know, we, like I said, we found a lot of our biggest response were from non-communicators in terms of understanding what they need to do and, and how they do that. The other thing I will say is that we are, as part of this sort of very uh, rough draft policy, we're looking at doing an opportunity to waive branding requirements in certain instances. Um, and so there's a few different instances in which we would sort of have a discussion on whether it makes sense to waive a particular branding requirement. So one of them may be if it compromises the intrinsic sort of neutrality or independence of a program. Uh, the case might be where it's a program that is doing is going to have some sort of result or recommendation in which it's not necessarily appropriate for it to be looking like it's coming from NSF, but it should be coming from the grantee itself. Um, it may be that it would incur inordinate costs or be just impractical, meaning the actual item or, or issue is something so small that there's no possible way of marking it or that the cost associated with uh, ensuring that the branding is appropriate is just not doesn't make sense. Um, that it could be perceived as an endorsement, um, and that's where we work very closely with our Office of General Counsel to ensure that anywhere that the logo is, that there's not that implication. And then also, we have a sort of more general sort of catch-all, which is basically if adding the NS logo, NSF logo would be inappropriate based on the nature of the partnership. And that's sort of our catch-all for cases that we just couldn't uh, you know, uh, imagine. And I would say it's been very interesting working of the directorates uh, sort of understand there's so many use cases. There's so much, as Lars uh, implied, so much complexity, especially when you start having partners involved. And, and NSF is, there's a lot more um, uh, direction. We're going a lot farther in terms of more and more partners. And so that's going to become a more and more, a larger issue as we figure out how do we balance needs of the partners in terms of that visual uh, identity. Um, you know, in terms of uh, other guidance on NSF logos, so anything where um, NSF, they have to have an, a relationship to NSF uh, to be able to ask for permission to use our logo. And so some examples of, of that would be a co-hosted conference or a seminar, um, an NSF official speaking at a non-NSF event, or an event at which um, NSF has interests and sort of furthers the mission of NSF, but is not really an NSF um, event. So engaging with NSF. Uh, I know we focused a lot on the visual parts of branding, but I wanna talk a little bit about some of the other ways that you can engage with NSF. And first and foremost is letting us know you have upcoming news. Um, it's always easier. Uh, the earlier you let us know that you have something coming, the better we can work with you and really help amplify and uh, raise up you know, the visibility of whatever you're, um, whatever you're announcing. Um, sharing your images in multimedia. Um, we are a society that very much values visual imagery and people will look at an image before they read anything. And so the, the impact of those image, I can't um, state strongly enough how important uh, compelling images and visuals are. So one thing I wanna share with you, a little sneak peek. Um, so we recently um, rolled out a digital asset management system within NSF uh, to collect, store, organize, and more easily share all of our imagery. Uh, it's been really successful. We've had all the directorates uh, develop a hub in the NSF Media Hub or a portal in the NSF Media Hub. And basically they're uploading all of their images, um, tagging them. It makes it so much easier to share amongst and between. Um, and within the hub, they've been able to sort of have their own sort of private collections and then share as needed, share with everybody, only a few people. So the exciting uh, news is that we are going to be rolling out a feature uh, on NSF Gov that is basically a portal for external facing people into our digital asset management system, which means that you will be able to share um, uh, your imagery uh, with us by just uploading it. No more WeTransfer, no more Dropbox, no more e you know heavily uh, image laden emails. The idea is that you will be able to 
log in, upload your image, tag it with a subject, and then also do the um, multimedia permission, which is what we call the 1515, basically saying that we have the rights to be able to use uh, the imagery. We hope this is gonna roll out sometime this fall. Uh, we're in the process of developing it. Um, we're super excited that we think that it'll make it a lot easier for people to be able to share their imagery with us. Uh, and if you're interested in being a guinea pig and testing it out, please come see me afterward. Uh, definitely could use uh, some more testers with that. Um, sharing your researcher stories. We have a lot of opportunities on our social media platforms, as well as uh, our new Discovery Files podcast to be able to highlight specifically the work of the researchers. If you haven't checked out um, the Discovery Files podcast, I highly recommend it. We've had a lot of really good um, speakers on there talking about their work. Uh, the most recent one that was posted on our NSF YouTube is uh, a virologist who gives a really great explanation of for a lay person very good explanation of viruses what's important how how they work and and what she's doing and then last i will say we have a science happens here campaign you may have seen some of the materials outside on the booth and we have a whole web page uh, on nsfgov dedicated to science happens now so it's a great opportunity to use the imagery that you have and share on social media uh, to be able to talk about what you do so this is just one example of uh, science happens here. Uh, and if you were uh, use the selfie booth, when you got the picture, you would notice that this little fun little frame, science happens here, uh, was put around your, your final photo. So with that, I'm actually fairly, completely done now. So thank you for your time and I appreciate it. Okay, we want to thank uh, Corey and Lars uh, for the presentation. So at this point, are there any questions uh, from the audience here or uh, virtually? Good morning. So if anybody has any questions after this event or three months from now, what's the best way to get a hold of you or other communicators in OLPA? Um, uh, yeah, if you could talk into the mic, because I think for virtual people, that's uh, on NSF Gov, we have a whole branding section. We also have a branding email that we have a team of people who uh, respond to it pretty quickly. So our turnaround time on our branding email is, I want to say, maybe a day. And if you mark it urgent, we can definitely turn things around really quickly. And we've had a lot of good um, good questions in there. And it's actually helping us build our case examples so that as we are looking to, as we continue to develop that policy, it helps us understand what kinds of things we need to address. Um, so I would say email, uh, it is a branding email is the best, or look on our website. Additional questions? And I'm sorry because I, I I can't I can't see the audience because of the spotlight. <laughs> okay, I, I actually I actually have a question, and and I think you know it, it goes to branding. You know, NSF and and Noir Labs actually did something that I thought was you know uh, uh, different, and and was you were very successful at it, and that was the transition from LSST to Ruben as far as the the branding, the name of it. And I'm just curious as to um, what do you attribute that success to? I mean, I, I think that in general, uh, it seemed to be a lot smoother than I necessarily would have thought it, it, it would have been. Uh, and, it, and it worked. Uh, and people, when I talk to in the public, in the amateur astronomy community, you know, they refer to it as Ruben, and people don't really know what LSST is any, anymore. So. Yes, that I think is a, is a good example. So the um, success uh, should uh, be attributed to the Rubin Construction Center, which is uh, actually not part of Noir Lab. Rubin becomes part of uh, Noir Lab when we go into operations. Nonetheless, I think that that campaign was very good. Several elements made it uh, very um, successful. Um, you involve the public in the um, decisions. You find names that are, um, you know, recognizable. In this case, a female scientist who's made a fantastic effort um, and uh, sort of impact on a field. And also, um, there were involvement of the uh, of the actual uh, people um, in Washington uh, at the Senate. I think there was a, a law passed, and it was a, in that sense it got visibility beyond where you would normally uh, get that. 
So yeah, I agree. We need proper names, and and uh, LSST just didn't cut it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any other questions? We do have a question from our remote audience. Um, will there be any research done on the NSF brand and brand recognition so that we can know if our efforts are working and what are the current brand metrics? Great question. That is a great question. And branding, along with a lot of, as many of you know, the public uh, affairs section, it's very hard to have that bright line to say, I did this and it resulted in that. There are definitely some cases in which you know, you can track, um, so for example, on our social media web presence, you can track visitors, you can track engagement, um, you know, but that doesn't necessarily correlate directly to branding. Um, I think for us, the metrics that we're looking at are part, at least in the beginning, more internal, because part of our biggest, I think, push is going to be ensuring that the people who need the branding information actually have it. So for example, um, you know, when I see presentations uh, by other directors with NSF, I see a lot more pickup in the use of our icons. I see more pickup in the use of our color palette, our fonts. I see people, you know, using some of the graphics that we've developed for the director. So what that tells me is that, that it, it, it's seeping in. People are starting to use it. They're finding what they need. Um, so for us, I think um, we're focusing really on the internal sort of pickup. Uh, but but that internal pickup is going to impact our external pickup because what we find happens is as people understand what th something is supposed to look like, they share that with other people. And so the opportunities for sort of force multiplier in, in essence, meaning like one person understands how it works, they tell someone else when they're asked. Um, we're still developing our final sort of external branding metrics, but we do have that in mind in terms of trying to sort of figure out what are the best indicators to show that what we're doing is making a difference? I know that in our recent, um, e the recent EHT announcement, um, you know, we saw a lot higher pickup um, in certain on social, certain social media platforms that we didn't prior to that. Um, and so we're trying to sort of compare and contrast and say, what did we do differently this time? You know, we had a dedicated YouTube stream this time. There's, so we did some very fundamental things differently that um, right now we're theorizing has helped helped. Um, in particular on social media, drive that visual identity up a lot higher than it would have been. So for example, um, New York Times did a story, didn't mention NSF at all, but the link they had in the New York Times story was to NSF's YouTube page. So that was something we did not get that first time around. And making that sort of the videos in advance um, that were very well NSF branded allowed that resource to be available. So when the New York Times wrote, even though they didn't mention us, if anybody went to watch the video, it was an NSF video. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and, and I think that that actually would be an excellent research project for a collaboration of large facilities to actually take on, submit a proposal to NSF to actually do the research on whether or not the, the branding uh, changes that you're making uh, actually are, are ha having an impact. And I think the results of that sort of study would be something NSF would be interested in and a lot of others would be interested in as well. Uh, Last opportunity for questions. Okay, I wanna thank everybody for being here. I wanna thank Lars uh, and Corey for a great presentation and, and OPA really seems like they're getting a lot of uh, tools and resources out there for the community. Uh, I'm excited uh, about the, uh, uh, the, the new system that's gonna be in place for getting images in. Uh, I already have an idea for <laughs> how, I'll, how I'll use that new system. Uh, just as a reminder that we will be back here uh, at 9, 10 a.m. So we have a little bit of a, a break. So but don't forget about us. We have a really exciting presentation uh, coming up on the, the roles of the large facilities and mid-scale facilities and research infrastructure uh, on uh, the workforce pipeline. And in particular, in this uh, presentation, we'll focus on K through 12. So thanks again. Let's give Lars and Corey a hand. <laughs>